All right, this morning we're going to be in Numbers chapter 19, and it is a strange text. It is about sacrificing a red heifer uh, and doing a lot of strange things with the red heifer afterwards. And so probably the biggest question when I read the text that you'll have is what in the world does this have to do with me and my life and 21st century today? Uh, And that's what I want to talk about this morning. What I think is really exciting about this text is you have here something written 30 300 years ago that guided an ancient group of people living along the Mediterranean Sea, the Israelites, uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, They paid careful attention to every detail. Even in the following centuries, even while Israel was not a nation, throughout the the centuries of world history, uh, Jewish people have been studying this text, analyzing every word, trying to figure out how to put it into practice. Um, And It is very relevant to things going on in the world today, Uh, but more importantly than that even, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but but it's just one of the many little things, hidden things, things we don't really think about or talk about a whole lot, uh, that to me should indicate we should be really excited about the return of Christ. Uh, And I, I believe, and I said a couple weeks ago, every generation, whether Christ comes in our generation or not, should be really excited about the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible calls on us. It's part of what it means to be a believer in Jesus is that we are putting our hope in the coming uh, of Christ. Uh, and, and so every generation is called to do that. But when there are things that are happening that sort of start lining up as things that have to be in place for Christ to return... We should pay attention to that. It it should help us. It should get us excited about it. And I I think very often we, I I say we as as Christians in in America, especially uh, uh, over the last number of decades, we kind of focus on some of the wrong things. Uh, For example, earthquakes. Uh, Every time there's a major earthquake in the world, it seems like there's a lot on social media. There's a lot of Bible prophecy teachers that come out and say, oh, this must mean that, that Jesus is coming back very soon. And I would just challenge that, uh, number one, and I, I preached through Matthew 24 uh, about a year ago. I'm not going to do that again this morning, but that's where Jesus talks about earthquakes. And I think when you study the context, uh, Jesus is answering the disciples' questions about when will the end of all things be, and, and, and basically he says, it's not earthquakes. Don't, don't, there's going to be earthquakes that are going to come and go and come and go. That's not the sign you're to look for. Uh, and, and sure enough, when you study the history of earthquakes um, by, by any seismologist out there, there, there's just no evidence that earthquakes are getting worse or more common or deadlier or anything like that. Uh, it, it's just kind of our perception that we want to focus on that when we hear of one. But there are other things that are going on in our world right now that I think are things that must come into place. And one of these has to do with the red heifer. So we're going to look at that text this morning. I'm going to read uh, beginning in chapter 19 of Numbers, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is a requirement of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the Israelites to bring you a red heifer without defect or blemish and that has never been under a yoke. Give it to Eliezer the priest. It is to be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. Then Eliezer the priest is to take some of its blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. Let's stop there. Let's, let's pray together. Dear God, I pray that you would help us uh, as, as we look at a uh, confusing text, in a lot of ways a strange text, uh, and just uh, give us uh, eyes to see uh, what this is all about, and, and, and may we just be all the more excited as we enter a new year that we might look forward more and more to the return of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I, I want to just begin to explain kind of what's going on in the text before we look at the rest of it. But what is the sacrifice of the red heifer? Then I want us to look uh, at the question, what does this have to do with Jesus? I think there are a lot of interesting connections between the red heifer uh, and Jesus and, and when he came the first time. And then I want to talk about some current events and, and why 
this should be something for us to pay attention to or be excited about um, with uh, some of the things going on in the world right now. So uh, first of all, what, what is the red heifer? Well, we've already looked at how uh, it is a heifer. It is a young female cow, just so we're all on the same page about what a, a heifer is. It's red, uh, so that, that is the color of it. Uh, it is without defect or blemish are some of the words put here. That's going to come into play. I'll talk more about that later on. Uh, and uh, it has never been under a yoke, so there are a number of qualifications. This isn't just any red heifer. James, should I switch to the handheld maybe? Okay, let me go ahead and do that. Um, All right, um, so it, is, it has a number of qualifications that, uh, that it needs to be in place for it to be a proper red heifer uh, candidate for sacrifice. And, and when it is sacrificed, the priest is to take some of the blood. By the way, it's sacrificed, verse 3 says, outside the camp. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about Jesus. Um, and slaughtered in the presence of the priest. And then the priest is to take some of the blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. That's, that's kind of odd. Uh, why seven times? Why does it have to be on his finger? Uh, the basic answer to that kind of question is, we don't know. But there is something significant to it. Uh, there, there's something significant about seven. There's something significant about how the Israelites had to march around Jericho seven days in a row and seven times that seventh day. And there, there's just something that signifies. Uh, there's some other strange things we're going to read in a moment. And we don't have to always know why God commands to do things a certain way. But there are connections, and I believe these things shape history in ways we don't know. If, if God gave this command and said, just sprinkle it one time instead of seven times, some of the discussions and debates and studies the Jewish people have had on this text over the centuries would have shaped and formed a little bit differently. And we have no way of knowing how that would affect the course of all of history. But I do believe that some of these things in this text in particular are meant to play out in a particular way and how God is going to bring things to its rightful conclusion at some point in the future. Let me go on. Let's just identify some of the things about the sacrifice from the text. Verse 5 says, while he watches, that's the, the high priest, the heifer is to be burned, its hide, flesh, blood, and intestines. The priest is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool and throw them onto the burning heifer. All right, so you've sacrificed the heifer the red heifer, without blemish or defect, never having worn a yoke. And as it's burning on the altar, it's turning into ash, you're to throw onto it these three items, cedarwood, hyssop, and scarlet wool. Why those three items? We don't know. I'm going to speculate a little bit, though, when we talk about Jesus, but, uh, but we'll come back to that. Verse 7 says, after that, the priest must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. He may then come into the camp, but he will be ceremonially unclean till evening. The man who burns it must also wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he too will be unclean till evening. A man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and put them in a ceremonially clean place outside the camp. They are to be kept by the Israelite community for use in the water of cleansing. It is for purification from sin. So what does the red heifer sacrifice have to do with? It has to do with how can someone be considered clean in order to worship in the temple, in order to serve in the temple, in order for any priest to go into the temple, they have to be clean. And one of the ways they are clean is by taking some of the water that is the result of this sacrifice. You take the red heifer, you turn it into ash, you burn it on the altar, you throw these three items into the fire so that it becomes ash with the heifer, you mix it with water. Now you have water that you can sprinkle on priests so that they can become clean so that they can serve in the temple. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, I want you to just picture the course of history. Something very significant happened in 70 AD. 70 AD is when the Roman army came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. They burned down the temple. They burned down the altar in front of the temple. Uh, when the Romans broke through the walls of Jerusalem and began slaughtering the Jewish people, uh, just to begin to get a picture of how big of an event this was, there are estimates that over a million Jews were killed by the Romans in that one battle taking over Jerusalem. 
A million Jewish people, this was nearly 2,000 years ago. So in today's terms, uh, a million is not even anywhere near the percentage of the population that would have been back then. It would have been uh, an even bigger kind of slaughter than even what the Holocaust was in, in modern times, just as a proportion uh, of the population. And there were Levites, there were priests who continued serving in the temple. Even as the Romans were coming into the temple complex, they were up on the altar in front of the temple. The altar was so large, uh, we, we often don't picture it, but, but it would just be this large area. You would stand on top of it, you would burn the different sacrifices on it, and they were up on this high altar um, continuing to do the morning and evening sacrifice as they were commanded by Scripture, even as the Romans were burning the building down. In fact, many of the priests died burning, falling off the side of the altar as they could no longer stay there uh, and continue the sacrifices. And the water for purification that was used at that time that was, came from one of these red heifers was destroyed. And that means that there was no longer a way to be purified from sin, to become clean, to serve in the temple. Now, I know not growing up in a Jewish culture where the temple stands, none of us have done that. That has disappeared from the earth since 70 AD. This brings up a lot of questions about what does that have to do with Christianity today. But, but let me just begin to share with you some things that, uh, first of all, I believe in the first century, there were a lot of connections that the first Christians made with the red heifer and Jesus. And I'm going to talk about those now. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the prophetic significance uh, of, of what all this means for our future. So let's talk about the red heifer and Jesus. And, and to set this up, uh, I, I want you to think that about being in a discussion with a religious uh, Orthodox Jewish person. And this Orthodox Jewish person has lived out uh, to the best of his or her ability, the Torah, all of their life. Uh, they have studied the Torah all of their life. And you come and you start telling them that you believe that the Messiah they pray for, and by the way, Jewish, religious Jewish people all over the world, if you don't know this, they pray every single day. They pray multiple times a day for the Messiah to come and fulfill all the promises that the prophets tell us about, which is exactly what we as Christians should pray for. We, we believe we know who the Messiah is, but we also are praying for him to come again. Peter, when he was preaching at Pentecost, spoke of the last days, and when he said last days, he meant this whole period from when Christ is in heaven, uh, and he said that we are waiting for uh, him to return, that heaven must receive him until the time appointed by all the prophets. So the same prayer that the first Christians were looking for, longing for, praying for, is basically the same prayer that religious Jewish people are praying. They just don't believe he's already come the first time. They don't believe they know who he is. But let's say you're speaking with a Jewish person, and you say, I know you're praying for the Messiah. By the way, they even use the name Yeshua in all of their prayers. They say, may Yeshua come quickly, which is the very name of Jesus, but it just simply means salvation in Hebrew. So they don't even realize it, but they're praying for Jesus to come by name. But let's just say that you're talking with them and you say, uh, you know, I believe that the Messiah is going to come in the future, just as you do. Uh, I just believe that, that that Messiah, I know him by name. He is Jesus. He is Yeshua. And you're going to get some pushback. And one of the areas that you're going to get pushback on is this area of sacrifice, because one of the things you might tell them is uh, that Jesus has come as a sacrifice for sin. And they are going to say, you've got it completely wrong. There is no way that Jesus could be a sacrifice for sin. And there's all kinds of writings, and uh, there are Jewish leaders, they're called anti-missionaries, that's kind of the name they go by. In other words, they try to speak against what Christian missionaries are saying. And so they have well-formulated arguments. They, they've developed these things, and they say, listen, Jesus can't be a sacrifice for sin because the Bible, the Word of God, tells us what is and is not a proper sacrifice for sin. A, a proper sacrifice for sin is a lamb that you bring into the temple, and it must be without blemish. And it must be slaughtered in a very specific way where the animal feels no pain. There's a very specific method taught in the Scripture and developed by the Jewish people of how you properly slaughter an animal for sacrifice. And what you Christians are saying is that Jesus, a human being, was slaughtered. I mean, right out of the get-go, 
Human sacrifice is pro prohibited by the Torah. You, you can't have a human sacrifice. But secondly, he wasn't without blemish. He was beaten. He was striped. He was a bloody mess uh, before he ever went to the cross to die. That, that would not be a proper sacrifice. No lamb would ever be accepted in the temple for sacrifice if it was beaten up, bruised, and bloodied before it got there. Uh, and then finally, the slaughter isn't the right method. It's by crucifixion. It's a painful, agonizing, slow death. It's completely the opposite of how you're supposed to perform form a sacrifice in the temple, and it's in the temple uh, where the sacrifice is supposed to occur. You're talking about a man crucified outside the temple. And there are a number of responses that you can give to this kind of argument. I think we as Christians honestly do a really poor job of this. We haven't listened to that argument. We haven't thought through how to respond to it. Um, but here's where we can begin, the red heifer, because as they claim that the proper sacrifice must be done in the temple, there is one exception. There is one sacrifice that specifically must take place, we read it in verse 3, outside the camp and be slaughtered. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So there is precedent in the Torah for there to be a sacrifice that takes place outside the walls. Now, the other thing I would say is that uh, the kind of sacrifice that Jesus is offering is completely different from the kind of sacrifice that was offered in the temple. What I mean by that is the temple sacrifices had to do with one kind of purity. When we talk about clean and unclean as biblical categories in the Bible, maybe you're most familiar with the lepers who had to cry out unclean because they were unclean. And then if they were healed, Jesus sent them to the temple authorities. They had to go through a certain procedure. By the way, the lepers went through a procedure where they had to have cedarwood hyssop and scarlet wool uh, were, were part of their ceremony of how they would be declared clean, just like the red heifer. There's a relationship between the red heifer and leprosy, or, or how a leper is declared clean. But they would, um, they would have to be declared clean. What does it mean to be clean? It's not about sin and not sin. Every single Jewish person, even Jesus when he walked on the earth, would become unclean at different times. It wasn't a sin to be unclean. It was a sin to be unclean and enter the temple for worship. So cleanness had to do with being in a state uh, where you had followed the regulations God wanted you uh, to follow that had set up so that you could enter the temple for worship. Same for priests, for any Israelite. Uh, that's what clean and unclean uh, had to do with. And so when we look at all the sacrifices that take place in the temple, they had to do with being outwardly clean so that you could enter the temple for worship. They had nothing to do with actually removing sin so that you could be in the presence of God in the heavenly temple, in the, the real temple, if you will. That's what Jesus Christ did. That was his sacrifice. It was a completely different kind of sacrifice. I, as a believer in Jesus and a believer in his sacrifice, that does not qualify me to enter the temple. It's a different kind of sacrifice, not the temple on earth. It does qualify me to enter before the presence of God in the heavenly temple. It, it is a much greater sacrifice. It's a much more important sacrifice. I believe Isaiah alluded to this when Isaiah prophesied in chapter 53. Many of us know Isaiah 53 is the chapter that talks about the sacrifice uh, of Jesus. It prophetically speaks of one who would be punished for our sin, who would bear our iniquity. The punishment that was to fall on us fell on him, and by his wounds we are healed. In the build-up to that, in Isaiah 52, that's really where the section starts. Isaiah 52, 14 says, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle Many nations. He will sprinkle many nations. That's red heifer language. What do you do with the water after you've prepared it with the ashes? You sprinkle the priests and the people so that they can be clean to enter into the temple. This is directly connected to the sacrifice of the Messiah here in Isaiah. And the author of Hebrews makes that connection as well. He sees what Isaiah is doing with the red heifer sacrifice. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, it says, The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. Again, it has to do with this outward physical 
on earth can I enter the temple or not? But then Hebrews says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Now this is, this is talking about what God does for us in sprinkling us with the blood, if you will, of Jesus Christ, symbolically speaking. Jesus, I think, makes a reference to this as well in Revelation 22, 14. Jesus is speaking right at the very end of Revelation. If you've been following the Bible reading plan with us, uh, you may uh, be reading this chapter today or maybe have read read it earlier. It's the very last chapter uh, in the Bible. And Jesus here says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They're the ones that get to go into the inner heavenly city. This is a red heifer reference. If you are sprinkled with the water, then verse 10 of our chapter, Numbers 19, it's not on the screen, it's just past our text, but, but there it says, the man who gathers up the ashes of the heifer must also wash his clothes, and he too will be unclean until evening. So, in other words, the, the final step in becoming clean through the ashes of the red heifer is to wash your clothes. What does Jesus say at the very end of the Bible about those who enter heaven? They, they wash their robes. It's a reference to completing that, that process Process, uh, to enter into the heavenly place. So I, I believe that uh, the first Christians understood the red heifer was a special uh, symbolic sacrifice that pointed to Christ. Even the items we looked at, uh, no one really knows why it's these three, cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool. We know they're used other places in reference to purification from death. All of this has to do with overcoming uh, the uncleanliness of death, the, the, the curse of death, if you will, which is what Jesus' resurrection is all about. Out. And the items just lend themselves towards picturing the cross. There's a piece of cedar wood. Jesus was crucified on a wooden cross. There's a piece of hyssop, which is what was used to give Jesus something to drink while he was on the cross. The scarlet wool could very well symbolize the blood that would come down from Jesus. On the cross, there's a scarlet cord that Rahab tied on the walls of Jericho so that her whole house would be spared and not killed when the Israelites overcame Jericho. It was a symbol there of putting one's hope in the coming blood of Christ. And here we have scarlet wool. Uh, The hyssop was used to paint the doorposts with blood during the Passover night. And so there's a reference here to wood Passover uh, and, and the hyssop there as well. All of these things point to Christ in, in, in some way. So all of these things, I think, point to Christ. But what does that have to do with us? Well, first place, I think that in the end times, at some point in the future, and I, can, I cannot set a date, I cannot tell you Christ is going to return in the next 10 years or the next 50 years or even the next 100 years, All I can do is tell you that there are certain things lining up right now in our world that I think the Bible has spoken of for a very long time, Uh, and it is exciting to see that. And I believe that in connection with those very last days, there will be many Jewish people in mass who will suddenly recognize that, yes, Jesus really is the Messiah that we've been praying for and waiting for. We, we did not realize it, but now we realize it. And I think that this passage will be one of the passages that helps them to see that, where it all just starts to fit together in their minds, that God will use uh, their traditions around this to help open their minds. But, but what else is going on? I, I want to share with you that um, what's going on in the war between Israel and Hamas right now is very much connected to this passage. And... Our Western media may not talk about it a whole lot, uh, but it is one of the driving things. So, so how could that be? Well, first of all, remember I told you that since 70 AD, there has not been the ashes of a red heifer. And that means that even if the temple were rebuilt, if they, they built a temple on the Temple Mount and it was a beautiful building and the altar was there and all the furnishings were there and they found the Ark of the Covenant and even put the Ark of the Covenant in and everything was there in the temple, the temple was rebuilt it would be pretty meaningless because no one would be allowed to enter the temple because no one is ceremonially clean. 
there would be no priest that could go in the temple. There would be no priest that could give a sacrifice because there is no red heifer with ashes that must be there to sprinkle them with so that they can serve in the temple. And so before you can have a temple, you need a red heifer. Well, there have been many red heifers. Uh, Jewish people say that nine red heifers existed from the time of Solomon uh, until the destruction of the second temple. Uh, but that doesn't mean there have only been nine red heifers in history. It just means there were nine that actually made the qualifications and were used for sacrifice. Red heifers are born every day. All right, there's nothing unusual about a red heifer. But it is very unusual for a red heifer to meet all of the qualifications set forth in this text, one of which is they have to be without defect and blemish, and when you study the Hebrew of it and the history around that, that means it has to be completely red. It can have one black hair, but no two black hairs on the red heifer can touch each other. That's, that's how it's been determined that that is without blemish. Um, and so there have been many red heifer candidates that have been born. In fact, I've heard for years, all growing up, I've heard about uh, big news stories about a red heifer was born. Maybe you've heard some of those. Uh, as far back as the 1980s, I remember people in a church I was at were all excited. A red heifer has been born in Israel. And, and it seems about every two years, there's this big international news story about a red heifer being born. And it's like, this is a sign that Jesus may be coming back. And I'm just going to let you know, no. Well, what's happened again and again and again over the past 30, 40, 50 years is that a red heifer candidate has been born. In order to qualify, they must reach the age of more than two years, two years in one day, and then a rabbi can examine them and say, yes, they are actually fully qualified. And so what has happened again and again over the last 40 years is that a red heifer candidate has been born, and there's all this excitement. Could this be the red heifer? And usually, almost always, before one year, someone says, no. It's got too much black on it. It's not a biblically qualified red heifer. Well, something happened last fall. There were five red heifers that were born that were qualified candidates that were given to Israel. They were actually born in Texas. They were sent to Israel. Uh, there were a group of Orthodox Jewish people that received them gladly and have been keeping them and taking care of them and have been saying, maybe this is... From this group will come the first biblically qualified red heifer since 70 AD. Well, every couple months, they would give a big update on it. And we passed the one-year mark. We passed the one-and-a-half-year mark. We got to August of this year, and it was just two months until the first one was going to reach the appropriate age to be a red heifer. In fact, I, I read this week that the date that the first one was going to reach the right age was October 15th this year. Well, October 7th, we all know what happened. We know that Hamas came into Israel. Maybe you don't realize it wasn't just a uh, let's come into Israel, kill a bunch of people, and then go back to Gaza. No, they planned to take over Israel. They, they planned to stay. They had all kinds of plans and preparations. They were going to just march through Israel and to Jerusalem. They were, they were thwarted. It was not as successful as they had planned it to be. We don't realize that, that it was very close to being much worse even than it was. But what drove them? What motivated them? And there have been all kinds of speculation in our country about the politics of Iran and Saudi Arabia and a peace deal, and they were trying to mess that up. If you ask them, they are going to, by and large, say, talk about one thing. They're going to talk about Al-Aqsa, which is the mosque that's on the Temple Mount. And there were stories, I was following them in September, about how in Arab media there was panic that there was going to be a red heifer. This was what was driving Muslim fears. Muslims were terrified that the red heifer was going to be declared qualified in October of this year, and it was going to lead to the rebuilding of the temple, and they said, we've got to do anything we can to protect the Temple Mount from the Jewish people building a temple. Now, I don't think the Jewish people had any plans to build a temple there, but that's just how their, or at that time at least, but that's just how their media was talking about it. They are largely driven by this fear of the red heifer. That's one of the things, one of the key things that set everything off. But, but what about, what does this mean for our times? Well, I believe in Bible prophecy that before Jesus comes, his final coming, where he's visible to all people, there will be a temple in Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 9 talks about how the Antichrist will come. He will put an end to sacrifice in the temple. Uh, Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. And a number of passages talk about the abomination of desolation being set up at the temple during the last seven years during the reign of the Antichrist. Well, 
To have the Antichrist come and do those things, put an end to sacrifice, put an abomination of desolation on the temple, there has to be a temple. And we are told these are things that precede the final visible coming of Christ. And what's fascinating to me is that October came and went. There was no news story about a red heifer meeting the biblical qualifications. But two months before, they were saying, we have five that are about to meet the right age, and they're still qualified. October 7th happens. I think it caused a delay in the public announcement. The people that are in charge of those heifers know that if they publicly come out and say they are biblically qualified red heifers, it's going to only inflame everything all the more in the Middle East. The Israeli politicians don't want that. Um, they're keeping quiet about it. In fact, everyone that has connections with people that work with those heifers are saying, they aren't saying anything. They have gone completely silent. They were giving updates regularly. Now they're saying nothing. Why are they saying nothing? Because the date has come and gone. And for the first time since 70 A.D., there is a biblically qualified red heifer. Now, that means that for the first time in, since 70 A.D., in nearly 2,000 years, no person living on earth could possibly meet the qualifications of being clean by biblical standards. Uh, the whole clean, unclean categories we read about in the Old Testament. No one could possibly be declared clean because there was no red heifer. Now there is a red heifer. First time since 70 A.D. A.D. Some are speculating now that it may have already been sacrificed, just done secretly. Um, we don't really know for sure about that or not, or if they're just trying to wait till the war is over to do that. But the potential is there today for them to do the sacrifice and for people for the first time since 70 A.D. to be declared biblically clean. This is just one of many things going on in our world today. I mean, one of those things is Israel controlling the Temple Mount. That happened for the first time since 70 A.D. that a Jewish state controlled the Temple Mount in uh, 1967. Uh, we have Hebrew being spoken as a real language in the land of Israel. Uh, that began to happen in the 1900s for the first time since 70 AD. We have a number of things falling into place. Now, again, does that mean Jesus is coming in the next 10 years? Does that mean the temple is being rebuilt in the next 20 years? No, I, I don't know. But I just see these things happening that the Bible has been talking about. Numbers 19 is very clear. This is a lasting ordinance that will go through all the generations of Israel. This isn't something that dies out. These are things that are being written about in the Bible that Jesus talks about, that the first Christians are talking about, speaking about all the way back in the first century, and we're seeing them fall into place for the very first time since the first century today, right in 2023. And so all of these things are just signs that we should be excited about the coming of Christ, even if we didn't see these things happening. But how much more when we see these things happening should we be putting our hope and should our minds be focused on the coming of Christ? This morning, I want to have a time of invitation, and uh, um, I just want to yeah, invite Mark and Stephanie, if you would, just come up and play a little bit. We'll, we'll sing uh, Come Thou Fount in a moment. But I want this to be a special time of prayer as we prepare our hearts for a new year. What is our number one passion in life? What is our focus in life? If we have as our focus anything other than Jesus, then it's in the wrong place. And maybe this is a morning, maybe this is a time for you to just simply say, you know what, more than anything else that I look forward to doing in the coming year, in the coming years, in the remainder of my life, God, help me to be more excited about living for you and your kingdom and being part of what you are doing in the world and seeing Jesus come again than, than anything else. Because that'll drive every other decision you make about what you do with your time, your resources. Uh, it, it will just change the way that you worship, and it will change your joy in life. Because there's nothing more solid and firm that we can put our hope in, our joy in, than Jesus Christ. There are some gathered around the sanctuary. They're there to pray with you, lift you up. Anything going on in your life you need prayer for, they're there. Some of you may want to come down front and just simply pray for God to be with you, for you to, to turn to God in a powerful way this coming year. This is your time of invitation. Will, will you stand with me? I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then we'll simply uh, sing together, Come 
not found. Dear God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this day, this coming year. God, I thank you that you are work at work in the world. I thank you that even these texts filled with strange teachings in the book of Numbers, we're seeing them play out on the world stage. We're seeing the nations just in turmoil and rage over even these things that your word speaks about. God, I believe you're in control. I believe you know all things. I believe you know exactly what's going on. I believe you don't allow any of these things to happen apart from your will. God, I know some of these things are judgment because the nations have turned their back on you. I know some of these things are putting in place your final salvation. God, may we put our hope in you. May we seek to be a source in our community, uh, those around us, our family, our friends that know us. May we be a source of pointing people to the only true hope, and that is in you, Jesus. And our prayer is, as Revelation ends, come, Lord Jesus, amen. We pray, come, thou fount of every blessing. Let's sing together. It's, come, you may pray, you may come forward if you want, or just simply sing where you are. you, Jesus, for your blood. We thank you for this new year. Uh, I pray my blessings on you, your family throughout this year. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day uh, celebrating together, and uh, we look forward to having you back with us next Sunday. God bless you, and again, Happy New Year.